Hey everybody, it's Pat Monahan here, back with you on the PatCast. Uh, I've been in studios kind of all over the place on the West Coast for the past couple of weeks uh, and still working on new stuff and getting closer to uh, being ready to record the music that, that is being written, so I'm excited about that. I'm in L.A. right now with the band and uh, also still in the studio, actually in gearing up for a performance at a tribute to Carol King, uh, one of the all-time, my my all-time favorite singers, songwriters, and uh, probably many of yours as well. Uh, excited as hell to do this show and uh, hopefully even sing with her. So uh, we've been working on some more podcasts while we've been here in L.A. And I wish I could spill the beans and tell you who they've been because they're really uh, they're really amazing. And, and I think you're going to love all of them, but... I've got to just keep it as a surprise for now. Anyway, this week we're going back to uh, the past summer and, and digging into the PatCast archives. We've been doing these for almost a year now. I can't believe that. It's uh, it's amazing how much we've actually done without even realizing it. When Train played Bottle Rock, uh, the Bottle Rock Festival in, in Napa, we did a bunch of podcasts that day or that weekend. Uh, and I think you've heard a bunch of them or several of them. Secret Sisters, uh, Donovan Frankenreiter and Jim Brewer. Uh, but there's one more that you haven't uh, had a chance to hear yet, and he's this week's podcast. His name's John Popper, and John has been the, in the public eye as the lead singer and harmonica extraordinaire in the band Blues Traveler since they signed their first record deal in 1990. Blues Traveler still they're still doing a lot of work. Uh, they're they're going strong, and uh, after several decades of nearly nonstop touring, Popper has a hell of a lot of stories, and and he told some of them. Uh, I think you're gonna dig them. So me and Jerry and Pergo and my daughter Autumn were actually uh, over at John's hotel, set up our mics, started rolling, and what we got was kind of the history uh, of a career in music. Some of it's funny, some sad, some tragic, but. John Popper has seen it all, and uh, he's had enormous success, in particular uh, the song Hook and Runaround. Hook is uh, one of my favorite videos of all time, too. Uh, they were huge hits, and in the middle of having these big hits, Popper started the Horde Festival, H-O-R-D-E. That's a, a really cool festival that, uh, I, don't know, I don't think we ever were on it, but it would have been something that we would have wanted to be on. It brought together many of the most popular bands in uh, the mid to late 90s and became a huge success. And despite the fact that the, the band was becoming a force to be reckoned with at pop radio, they found a warm welcome in the jam band scene as well, which has always embraced them for their virtuosic musicianship. And that's not to mention the cameo appearance that they made in one of my all-time favorite movies, Kingpin. John tells us about that particular thing in the video and then tells us about a few other bizarre run-ins he's had with bill murray but he's seen lows as bad as the highs were good blues travelers bassist bobby sheehan died of a drug overdose in 1999 and around the same time popper had his own struggles that led him to uh nearly lose his own life and now uh, he's in better health and and, uh, and touring behind a new record, John and Blues Traveler seems to be on track and kind of refocused. John's outspoken views on politics and uh, and people and politics that are against gun control have made him a compelling guest on a number of formats. He's been on several podcasts and TV shows, and he's not shy about telling you how much he loves his guns. Uh, he brings it up here. And I don't agree with his feelings, but you guys can hear his arguments for yourselves and uh, make up your own mind. We also uh, got to play a song of his off of his new record, and you'll get to hear that in his trademark harmonica style. And Jerry reminds us uh, of the time that we dragged him off the street to play with us in Washington, D.C., when he came and played at a place that no longer exists called the Bayou, and uh, that was with the Pat McGee Band. I gotta do a podcast with Pat McGee, by the way. But anyway, right now, no Pat McGee. We're going back to John. So here it is, this week's podcast from Napa, California, Blues Travelers, John Popper. What do you do when nobody's looking?
Hey, this is Pat Monahan again. John Popper here. Uh, thanks, John, so much for talking to me. Uh, well, I heard you, for you've done me. some other podcasts. Uh, oh, I do podcasts all the time. Oh, that's awesome, man. I've been a fan of the pod since the uh, Body Snatchers movie in the 50s. <laughs> That sounds weird. Of course, they all look like I, giant Brussels sprouts. Man, that movie, what a weird movie. It's, uh, you're, you're showing both of our ages with yeah. that whole body snatch. <laughs> well, we were thing. children watching it on television. Yeah. Of course, it was a zenith television. So. <laughs> and, and only part of the movie came in yeah, exactly. at my house. Yeah, and with where, the did you, where did you come up, though? You came up uh, at, in New York? Um, yeah, well, Stanford, Connecticut. Oh, Connecticut. So I was cool. a suburbs kid. And it's funny because you live in a place called Snohomish most of the time. Yes. And I live uh, in a place called Sammamish. Yeah, also Sammamish. in Washington. I'm familiar with Sammamish. Yeah, I'm familiar with Snohomish, but not well. I don't know that area. And then my wife is from Snoqualmie it. and yeah, that's right. Sammamish or like all, s- s- yeah, Sammamish with one M. Yeah. Yeah. There's all kinds of stuff in the Sammamish and and then Skyhomish. Yeah. And I lost a bet to an old girlfriend about uh, whether she read that wrong. Oh, really? And she was completely right. <clears throat> well, uh, you chose the most amazing place, I think, to live in the world, right? Um, it is gorgeous. Yeah. I love it. Why there. do you live there? Why, why have all um, the places? I was engaged uh, to somebody who lived in Seattle. Yeah. And I was living in uh, Pennsylvania at the time. And actually, I'm from Pennsylvania. Where did you live there? I like? lived in um, Quakertown. Wow. Why did, why, where did you live? I, I'm from Erie. Oh, yeah. But well, you were more like York there. area. Yeah, I was yeah. really like, I, w- again, we grew up in Princeton. New- well, see, I moved from Stanford, Connecticut around high school. I want to say 83. Yeah. And uh, it was like right before my 16th birthday. And it turns out the driving age being in Connecticut, 16, it's 17 so was, in New Jersey. So, so you were like, sweet, Connecticut rules. But they moved me to New they Jersey. They moved you to New Jersey. Great. Right on my, the day I was going to be driving. <laughs> And Are you tell, serious? But I got a moped out of it because you can oh, drive. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so that's awesome. Well, that's a, good, that's a good trade anyway for a little while. But uh, it was there that I met my, what would become my band. And, you oh, know, I great. mean, Princeton was really where I made a real great connection. And, you know, I mean, that was kind of my hometown. And everyone, as, you know, we got money and stuff, we all moved away. I was really kind of the last guy to move away. I, I moved to pretty much, I, I'm a gun nut, but in New Jersey, that's a dirty word. Like, yeah. you can have guns if you bury them in your backyard and try not to think about them too often. I think there's a law you can think about them twice a day. Yeah, the guns. And, <laughs> and then just just don't ever say anything again. Yeah, very Homer Simpson of the guns. Ex- exactly. Just think about them and move on. Yeah, and just to, But in know, Pennsylvania, man. Pennsylvania, you know, guns, I mean, there's lots of gun owners And this that I was know. right as the Clinton ban had started. That's when uh, I came into like, oh, can we can we say shit ton in front you of your say, daughter? You can say whatever you want. Okay, a shit she ton of money. I just don't want to say it loud. Oh, right. Shit, and ton, a shit ton of money. An SH double hockey sticks full of money. <laughs> That's not, you, didn't, you spelled two different words. I didn't say words, I was man. a good speller. You're terrible. A Z you know double you hockey stick. So, I think what you, okay, sorry. Yeah. So I get to Quakertown and suddenly I can now kick open my front door. I got 32 acres and just from my living room, you know, empty a clip from my assault rifle. I mean, this was. <laughs> Basically, I'm running around my how underwear in my in, front yard. I have all this guns? seclusion. What was like the... Well, I think being in New Jersey, you're not allowed to. So it's sort of like this, oh, my but God, I'm free. But your parents weren't interested, right? Well, my dad was into shotguns. But oh, he was. I was never... We never had handguns, which hmm. made me, of course, love handguns. Sure. It's the thing, forbidden fruit thing. You know, it's funny because uh, I have two sons. Uh-huh. And my oldest son really loved hunting. And I was like, I don't know where that comes from. I'm not into either one other, of them. The younger and one's just no, into strangling people. No, my younger one just into the knife just garrot wires no No, what he's into is tires and cars yeah not into that either they're both phallic things they're both dick things but i don't i don't like i don't even uh, where did that come from look at the um read marcus aurelius into each of those things what do they do they take stuff and get it far the fuck over there really fast, which right. is what a dick is supposed to do. Like, you know, you pee or you come and you hit something far away or your dick is really... With a gun, you're That's knocking something over. About. With a car, you're getting yourself way far over there. It's a right. torpedo. It's all phallic. I'm pretty sure uh-huh. you're going to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as the greatest uh, harmonica player that has ever lived. You feel like that's part of your destiny? Um, it could be. Uh, believe me, I'm would, s- would it matter? Hard. Well, um, does that stuff matter to you? If if it'll get me paid more, sure. Yeah. You know, is, I mean, it, it's, it's, is it about making a living and and not not as much about? Uh, oh yeah. Uh, not as much about the trophy and all that. Um. Well, I mean, it it never should be anyway. Yeah. I mean, uh, has it ever been? 
Um, well, certainly if you can do it, you know, like that's sort of fun, like when you're at the amusement park, if you can, you know, hit the little thing and get the giant bunny, you want the giant bunny. But then after a while. Well, I mean, I want everything that I can possibly get, but I mean, am I going to, is that what I'm obsessed about? No, I mean, I, I want to, uh, Bill, Bill Graham really laid it out. You, you want to make a living and express yourself. Yeah. And outside of that, the rest is bullshit. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a good way to put it. But it's fun to get bullshit. I mean, I wouldn't, you know lose sleep over any of that but you know sure you want to be on every tv show you can you want to be on uh and all you think about are the shows you haven't been on you right. know it's like there's a little of that captain ahab thing but you know that's silly it's a, you, you so it, like there's a reason i don't live in hollywood because i am such a star whore that you know like i've watched movies all my that's really the thing i haven't really been into music as much as i've been to movies hmm. and i saw um christopher walken i got to go to uh the excess baggage premiere because uh, Alicia Silverstone and I hung out for a while and you know I wrote her this letter and I got to hang out with her she was really nice and trying to feed me better and you know oh really get me into the vegan thing I got her to admit that if I hunted an, an elk and just <laughs> ate that it would be more humane than if we the way we torture our beef and if I substituted the beef right it's actually more humane to kill your own animal sure I know this and um, she also thinks Ted Nugent should be violently raped to death are you friends with uh, Ted. Um, yes, as a matter of fact, I am also. And do you believe he should be raped to death? I don't think that's really in the spirit of the hunt either, you know? Or, <laughs> I just or, thought maybe just that as a joke. Like, it'd be like, you know, I know that guy. It'd be funny to watch. You know, that kind of I thing. I would like to be roofied, but only by somebody that knew me. Yeah. You know, like, I, I I'd know like people, to see what that's I like. know people who roofie themselves. No, uh, uh, Pergo right here next to you is doing the sound for it. But he doesn't remember doing it. He doesn't remember, but oh. it got weird. See, you got to watch you. Don't be alone with yourself. If you, you can have avoid to it. watch you. You really need to. Bring a hand mirror wherever you go. And so you've worked with uh, a good friend of mine, Sam Hollander. What did you do with Sam? Um, what didn't we do? Did you write and did he uh, record you guys? Um, we, we actually went and got a bunch of writers that we um, really hadn't worked with before. I was going to say that we liked, but um, yeah. that wasn't this record. Uh, it was more an experiment. Uh, let's pick some good writers, see what sticks to the wall, and then uh, we I think the record them. sounds amazing. I'd, I'd like to do a song with you later that I think is uh, super great with the first track off the Absolutely. record. Absolutely, sure. Uh, but how did you feel about the outcome of working with these different writers? Was it a weird experience for you? Um, for me, I, I'd just done something before with my solo record, uh, The Dusk Great Troubadours, but that was with friends of mine who were good writers. So it and was, was that the first time you ventured outside of your circle? Very much. It was yeah. the first time that I um, learned about co-writing, and it was so great to sometimes not even have, have written the song, but just be Diana Ross and have someone write for you. Right. And that was a fun thing and, to do. And that's a later in your career kind of thing. <clears throat> that really happened, was. That happened to me. Like we, when, we, when you start a band, if, uh -huh. I'm not sure if your band is similar, everybody thinks that they know, like, you too does it this way, but it's all bullshit, and no one really knows how we, anybody does. Re, yeah, we really thought that you're supposed to do it yourself. Was there a rule? Was there like a band rule? Here's it, the way we're going to do it. It became, I was doing most of the writing, uh, and the band was like, then, you know, I got to lord it over them. So that gave me more power. Hmm. You know, it was like well, this you're, dynamic. Well, you're singing, so, you know, there's like the, you have to deliver the message. And then there was a period of time when they were like out drinking and I was the sober guy. Right. So and that makes you, uh, you know. Even more the, how dare you suggest anything. It's that's funny. The thing. It became a point where like I was sort of suppressing them. And I mean, but that, did, did you good. feel like you were doing that or did they um, feel like that? I think I had bouts of guilt and I don't think they were aware that, you know, they're like, cool. <laughs> you know, I think that's right. what they were thinking. And, uh, but see, then the problem is uh, when the party got to the point when Bobby died. I, like my bass player, who's no longer my bass player, because uh -huh. he had such a massive problem that it was just, it was like cancer within my band. Mm -hmm. And if we stayed a band with everybody, original members, we were all going to die. See that? Not, not physically, I but kind the of band had that, was going to well, die. I kind of had that going, too, where if I didn't stop uh, touring, I felt like I was going to die. Hmm. But I also was very, I felt fairly, I felt a likelihood that the only thing keeping him alive was the structure of being on the road. Because hmm. if we stopped, he would die. So there was a point where I remember saying, I just am going to have to risk that because I know me and I'm theorizing about him. And then, you know, he did die. When and when, stopped. how close were you at the time? Were you partying together? Was oh, I wasn't partying at all. Then. I mean, my party was at McDonald's. Okay. I was 436 pounds. So like I had to stop because I was getting, uh, no, I was doing the, the legal drug that didn't mess with your brain, but was making me enormous, hmm. you know? And, um, 
so I went and got, the last time I saw him alive, he was two, hour, two hours late for my intervention. Because mm. the band came to me and said, John, we're all worried about Bobby. Oh, wow. And he didn't look good. Mm. And, um, you know, then I talked to him on the phone a couple times after that, but he was living down in New Orleans and he was doing stuff that we weren't really that aware of. And was he working with you and re like showing up on time? And Yeah, but he, we didn't expect much because, again, I was doing, I was very much in control. So I was doing a lot of the musical decision making yeah. as to what the band would do. And they didn't want to deal with me because I was an absolute emperor. Really? And so the problem was... But weren't they? It was you easy know, not to notice. I mean, what else was I expecting of him to do? I mean, why wouldn't he be drunk every day? I wasn't giving him much of an outlet. But that at the same time, problem. you know, there's, there's a, I think there's a lot of sides to all these things. Of course. And, and, and the other of side course, is, sir. man, they're really lucky to have you. Yes. No matter how Believe demanding me. or overpowering I, you might be. In a way, be, I'm feeling guilty for you. working all the time. I mean, you know, that's, that's what I'm doing there. So, I mean, that, the thing that I knew is that we were, it, it's codependency is what that is. Sure. It allows me to sit there and eat and feel sorry for myself and get big and go, well, what about you? Right. And then he's going, well, what about you? And then, you know, we sit there and, and, you know, in the meantime, I am not socially doing anything. And these guys are going out and representing us, which in their minds at the time felt like a very important thing to do. And I guess it kind of was. Yeah. You know, I mean, somebody had to screw all those models. Thank God. <laughs> so, uh. Here's what I remember. Uh, uh -huh. We played the Greek theater. We opened for you. And right before you was Joan Osborne. And Joan Osborne is one of my all-time favorites. Oh, yeah. You may not remember this. I'm not well, sure where you were Well, she was the first person I ever played with in New York City. Well, she's a spectacular singer. Like, I think she's yeah. a gift. I just saw her. She's I've seen her several voice. times yeah. since, but I haven't seen you since. Uh -huh. And one of uh, the reasons why I was really hoping that you would do this podcast is because... I just like decent people well, thank because you. we all have these higher, like when you meet fans, you know, you, I, I want to see how people re interact with the people that love them and mm -hmm. whether you're going to respect them back and just really understand that, hey, you can't pay your mortgage without that lady that might be wanting a picture and driving well, you nuts. Well, of course. Yeah. And so a guy came up to you who was like one of the promoters and I just overheard. Uh -huh. They were like, man, John, look at all these people. And you were so e excited and grateful and you were like, Man, we sold this place out. I just, I'm so, so, I'm just so thankful. What a great night. And you looked around and I was like, that's a good dude, man. I like well, that guy. thanks. I'm glad that, I, thanks for reminding me of that. You remember that's, I mean, you've probably I don't sold that, that out a hundred times since then, but uh, I don't remember that was the first that, time you ever did. I um, am things were, definitely glad that I noticed it. Well, and I'm glad that I heard that because uh, then I could stay a fan because I'm just like that. Had you had a derogatory answer for the guy, like, dude, I'm busy or something. I've been like, all right, that's enough, you know. Well, you know, I got, I'll tell you who I'm a fan of. Uh, I have a sort of a contrary story to that. We were in, uh, we finally sold out Madison Square Garden. And, you know, um, I see this, it looked like it was a thousand years old, the little elevator operator guy with his uniform on and yeah. the little epaulets. And I'm, he must have been there since the 20s. And I said that to him, like, you must have seen every show here since the 60s right. or the 50s. I mean, you know, um, the Ali um, Frazier fight. Uh, wow, yeah, I didn't I mean, think about that. Uh, Frank Sinatra, uh, you know, the Stones. What was your favorite thing you've ever seen here? And he looked up at me with those kindly old eyes and said, get the fuck on the elevator. <laughs> and I thought, I am oh now your God. fan. I thought I was his fan for. I yeah. was like, that's the coolest thing you can see. Man, I'm so glad you said that because I <laughs> dislike you as well. And this <laughs> this elevator ride is going to be more comfortable for both of us. I was now. like, yeah, you know, shut the hell up. You're one night. I got a, yeah, I've got a thousand oh, nights. That's so and you're funny. one of them, buddy. Just get on the yeah. elevator. <laughs> Look, I'm going to stab you if you don't get in. <clears throat> it's so New York, but in the best way. And you know the opening of that 10 years of effort to get into Madison Square, our one and only time headlining it. That's um, so great. I still, that's still we're one of my dreams. And the guy whose studio we were rehearsing at, some you know piece of shit studio, um, he had this human beatbox suit where he looked sort of like the human fly. And he was showing Bobby, who's got this big, kind heart. Yeah. I was like, let's have him open for us, Madison Square Garden. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. And you did, right? And it was like, blues, 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 traveler, 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 as he hit various <laughs> parts of his body. And we're thinking, okay, this will be two minutes. Right. You know, how bad, you know, a lovely beginning. So the lights go down. And, ah, there's that sound you've been dreaming of your whole life. Right. 
The guy does 45 minutes of blues, 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 blues. It's so like oh that. My God, turns man. into a murmur. And, oh, so like, and then they're just throwing things. I remember looking at Bobby going, you just gave away our 10 years worth of applause to oh. the human fly. Man, here's, here's another John Popper moment. Actually, Jerry over there, uh-huh. he used to be our tour manager. Ah. And worst tour manager you could ever imagine. Like, oh, there you go. See, beyond, yeah, Gina, Gina knows how this is, uh, how yeah, the abuse that yeah, we keep terrible. on you. Like, tour management it, it, brethren. It, if you think of what terrible things there are for people to choose to do, that was his top. Did you wake up with a penis inside you? <clears throat> Only twice. Well, then you are pretty bad. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, that's but, your job not to let so, that happen. So Jerry... Jerry, well, yeah, it was your. It, that's even worse. Yeah, he's you're getting he's, something out of it directly, <laughs> and he's paying you for the privilege. Yeah, I mean, not weird. again. He's paying you to put that there. That's, so, oh. we're in D.C. at a place called the Bayou. You remember that? Oh, room? I played the Bayou. Yes. And so uh, we were opening for a friend of mine who has become a friend of mine. His name is Pat McGee. I know Pat McGee. I actually played with him at the Bayou. Okay. Well, that guy right there is the guy who told you to come and play. Oh, cool. He yeah. was outside, and he was like, dude, I just saw John Popper, man. I, I think just, he's going to come and jam. It was so like you a came Christmas and, or Easter reunion so you, time or something. You played Ramble On with us on harp. So you guys were there, and I played with you guys. You played with us. You played Ramble On. And then I played then with Pat, Pat McGee. Then Pat McGee, and you played the whole night with him. And yeah, he did yeah. this thing that we we laughed about for maybe three years straight. <laughs> and then we still remind each other. But Pat did this thing where he would like chant and then the crowd would chant back. Right. And while you were up there, you were playing and he was so like overwhelmed that you spent the whole night with him that he was playing, you know, like hippie jam. Like, <laughs> and he's like, everybody say John. <laughs> John. Everybody say Papa. Papa. And oh, it's God. a beautiful man. It's a beautiful man. And then it just got really <laughs> weird. And we were, we just was drove Pat, around was, the country for three years going, John. He thought it was a beautiful man. He has beautiful thighs. It was like so funny. Wow! But he was trying to pay you, you know, the highest respect. Yeah, I, but I you became was, the greatest time for us for I just years. Remember, I was so hanging thanks. at my cousins in Chevy Chase, like I always do, and I was like, you know, I just kind of got to get out of there and get a layer. <laughs> there was the Bayou. Man, I don't tell. That's was uh, that the was last that, night that, of the- you played the last show? No way. Yeah, man, you closed that place. God, I'm glad the potato salad was off. I would have never left my cousin's house. <laughs> <laughs> it's wow. really cool. Like, Serendipitous. I think it's cool that you do that, that you would do are, things yeah. like that. That was like a very high-profile time in your career. See, to me, that stuff is just fun to do. And that's the way it should be, man. Isn't music like why we did this in the first place? And then it's like air. You know, like that's the thing. People always talk about how you're lucky to do it, or it's a blessing. But it's it's like saying you're blessed when you take a really good dump. Or when you get to drink water, I look at it so much like um, like a junkie who gets who's looking for smack. You know, you don't look at getting to do something you love that much with such um, distance. You know, right. such appreciative. You know, like let's ponder. You know, it's not a General Foods moment. It's not like ah, what was the name of that waiter, Jean Luc? You know, right. you never get to sit there and ponder it that way. It's more like yeah, okay, I got that one. You know, you're looking for the next one. Right. It's, yeah, it's true. You're looking for the next one. It's a function of survival for me to the point where I sometimes I don't notice it. Do you ever like, uh, I remember years ago, I, yeah. I, I had a therapist because I was... I know, still got one. I was in a terrible uh, relationship uh-huh. and just wondering like, man, I, I thought I was a decent guy, but I, I guess I'm not and I'm starting to if it's, act If like it's a terrible a relationship, decent. odds are you are a decent guy. And, well, and I just, she's probably not that bad either. That's usually maybe when things are going great, you're probably a psychotic. Well, that's maybe, but I I'm pretty sure she's a terrible person and I'm awesome. That's what that, that's what the therapist told me. That's what they get paid to do. <laughs> she's should yeah. she's smart. She's got a therapist telling the yeah, exact same thing like, about you. She was like, you got to get away from that. Yeah, whore. he's he's terrible. horrible. He's bad. So uh, yeah. I see this th- therapist and uh, she. I was telling her, man, I just, I'm not happy. I, I'm never happy. I travel. I get to do all these great things. I, I have all so these no, things. And she was like, I want you to do me a favor. Softly, man. Stand up. Yep. And I was like, okay, this is weird. Because I don't, you know, this was like the second time I was with her or whatever. Uh-huh. Now I want you to put both 
I want you to put one hand on your stomach, okay, and one hand behind your back. And I was like, okay. And she goes, now I want you to bend down. Uh-huh. And then I did that, and she was like, oh. She was like, finally, you need to like congratulate yourself. Sometimes you need to stop where you are and go, I'm pretty cool, man. I did some good stuff. I did a great job, and I'm so terrible yeah, at right. that. I'm the worst at saying, who's, like... Who's good at yeah. taking a compliment? Well, I guess the point is... You know, you're saying you're nice driven, stuff about... You're talking about me being the Rock Roll Hall of Fame, and, you know, what I do is... Uh, well, of course, you dis- you've you deflected, it, but, yeah, you know, and it's... Your eyes glaze over, and you go, thank you, but, you know, the difference between a professional musician and an amateur is... You'll come up to an amateur and say, hey, that was a great set. And they'll go, are you kidding? We screwed this up. We screwed that up. I was yeah. flat. This was all. And a professional just goes, thank you. But he hears the same thing. Right. You know, I mean, and nobody takes a compliment. I well. say both. So I don't know what that makes me. I say, are I you kidding you, me? And then I blame the band. They were terrible and they're out of tune half I was the time. Talking to you, but thank you if you were talking to me. If That's I was talking to you, you would tell me that. But <laughs> if a fan came up and talked to you, you would you know that the fan yeah, is just trying to say something nice. Yeah, yeah. An amateur would yell at the fan. You know, yeah. Be like, no, you're an idiot for liking that. Yeah, how could you like that? Get, or you could be like yeah. the elevator guy, who is now my favorite guy. Yeah, I know. I uh, love that guy. You know, uh, that show business, you get hard and crusty. And you there, just, there were so rah. many things I wanted to talk to you about. Like, and yeah. so here's the short list. But uh, uh-huh. uh, first of all, can you tell me what it was like being uh, in one of my favorite movies of all time, which is uh, Kingpin? And did you get that to meet awesome. the Farrelly brothers? Uh, yes. Because a uh, friend of mine is writing with the, one of them right now. Well, the fun thing for us... Oh, look at that picture. You That's amazing, did. Autumn. Way to go, kiddo. Autumn, wow. I want to say this is a spaceship or a car. What, what is, is that, it? kiddo? What is the airplane? Airplane. It's a cross between... A, if a spaceship and a car had a baby, it would be an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> she loved that one. <laughs> She's laughing. <laughs> No, you need yeah. to get out of that elevator. Yeah, spaceships it's, and yeah. It's a, it's Jerry, me, and Daddy. Aww. All right, which one's you? That's There's me. A, see, that's good. You're the biggest one. Oh, that's cute. Oh, honey. look at that! I see. There's a man on the wing of the plane. <laughs> um, so you were working with the Fairley Brothers a, um, a little bit, right? They were. I, I heard they really wanted to get Hootie. That, oh, that's really? what I heard. I'm sorry. Um, You're so Darius. But yeah, of course. I heard. Yeah. But we were available. So. Man. Amen. And then, according to my manager at the time, they really would love it if you'd act. But according to them, his manager said he really wants to act. So. <laughs> anyway, I got to be uh, the guy going, welcome to the Reno Open. Yeah. Enjoy the 32 topping potato bar. <laughs> and I went and saw it in um, Houston. And there's like an empty movie theater and yeah. like six people maybe. And then I'm looking and there's my dad. Look, I looked exactly like my dad. <laughs> hair goose back, like 60 feet tall going. But then that movie tall. has become, you know, a cult classic. Oh, absolutely. You're on everybody's radar. Yeah, for now. our part, doing the movie meant going to Pittsburgh. Um, and from right before sunup to right after sunset. Huh. Playing, you know, lip syncing, but anyway, sure. over and over again. Great song, man. As You're they old. danced about and had the scenes they did. And yeah. we don't know what's going on. And we just know that people are fussing over us. And we don't have to remember any lines. And we're being treated like we're special. Right. And so bit parts are the best thing to do in a movie. Because there's no responsibility on you to learn anything. Sure. But you get to yell, get Apple to- Box. <laughs> Everyone goes, what, what? Or go, that's lunch. Yeah, and that's you just right. call lunch and they, go, they look at you all mad, I'm like, oh, you guys. But, you know, it's like, you're sort of extras, but you're not really extras. Yeah, you're right. Sort of stars, but not you're talent, stars. but not that talented. Yeah, exactly. You're the kind of talent where you're willing to start some shit, but yeah. like Woody Harrelson, he can't do that. I've been in those situations, and I always leave going, "Do you think I stirred up enough shit?" And, oh, absolutely. You know, it's just like, yes, we need to leave fast. And you know, Woody was cool, but I got to spend that one night where was, I was he cool playing my dad and. Um, was Bill Murray was the best. He had yeah, that guy's you know that genius. loose piece of hair he has incredible in the scene yes. where it's like flying. Yes, he's talking to him. You ever see Belushi with the bee thing and he's talking? Yes, and he gets it moving. He was doing that with the the whole time. Everybody's talking to really. It starts just sort of encroaching in between you two, <laughs> oh, and then man. he's getting it moving. Yeah, and he'll nod. Yeah, and it was like a puppet master making. Man. that. He was like a whole separate character. You know, was my hair. greatest Bill Murray story, uh, or my only Bill Murray story, is he he came and saw us when we were out with um, uh, Matchbox 20. Uh-huh. 
and he came to watch the bands, and he came uh, into our dressing room after we played with mm-hmm. his, his wife at the time, yeah. and he told everybody what they did wrong. First of all, you need to smile. You need to get your head out of your ass. You need to take, you know, but it was funny. Uh-huh. It was very critical and yeah. hilarious. Mm-hmm. And then he was like, you, to, uh, to my bass player, he yeah. was like, I don't even know what you're doing anymore. I just, uh, 50%. And then my drummer goes, you know, Mr. Murray, uh, I've seen about all of your films, and some of them were around 50%. And he oh, grabbed them no. and he goes, I like you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Man, that guy. I've got a Bill Murray story. Well, all right. I want to hear it. The last time I saw him, you know, so we hung out a little bit. And like, hey, and we Incredible. were both Bulls fans. This yeah. During the three-peat, I'm hanging out with Rodman, you know, and uh, he's hanging out with Michael Jordan. And we're waiting outside the Jersey Nets. And I want to say something clever. Because when Bill Murray's around, you sure. just are aware he's Anything. funnier than you are. Yeah. By doing nothing. Like sometimes exactly. you'll ask him, like, he'll ask you what time is. Like, I don't know, Bill, what time is it? <laughs> yeah. And like, so he can never get the time that way. Yeah. It's sort of annoying being him that way. And um, so this is right after Space Jam came out. So it's him and me. And I'm like, so, Bill, I saw you in that bunny movie. And I said it like that. Like, it came out of like dickish and pithy. Yeah. You know, like I was, yeah, yeah. Right. Like goes, you were about to throw a gag at him. Yeah. yeah and like, he's like, funny movie and then suddenly jordan comes out so all the press comes out and then i never see him again like, right so all i'm left with for years is bunny, bunny movie, movie. <laughs> and i'm like i have to live with that like, bunny Man, movie. that's terrible you yeah. had oh, your it's magic horrible. moment this was my magic moment to like you know say something yeah. and that's where we leave it I cut guess. to south by southwest uh, 2009 i'm starting to do this dust i just recorded the dust grays album yeah and, you know, I've had this uh, apocryphal moment where, you know, I'm fed up with the way Blues Traveler's been writing. And, you know, it's, yeah. everyone brings something I write. It's like a assembly line. And I've had this great breakthrough. And I go to South by Southwest. And there's Matthew McConaughey, Woody Harrelson, and Bill Murray sitting at a table. Dude. And I sit down and go, what are you guys here to whore yourselves like I am? And yeah. McConaughey goes, I ain't here to whore myself. And then he starts recognizing me. And he realizes, all right, this isn't just some schmo off the street. And yeah. And Woody and I remember we talk, we're talking like, hey, man, how's it going? And, you know, they're looking to party and stuff like that. And Bill's just been sitting there. He looks at me and goes, can you play Red River Valley? <laughs> and he says it just like that. You mean the song? Like, and I'm looking like, sure. And so I go, yeah. You know, I got the harp right here. So, uh, He's transfixed. It's as though I'm doing Shakespeare. Incredible. And he's biting his, oh. And so now we're hanging out and partying. And I'm telling him, he said he saw us at the spinning stage in uh, Cape Cod, and, or Marth, I think it was Nantucket, actually. Mm. And um, he was going on about the drummer, who like, never gets enough credit. You yeah. know, I, mean, I get a lot mm. of credit. And he, just the way it, it really mattered. And I was telling him about how I was trying to take... This is before Susie Cracks the Whip that Sam worked on with us. Yeah. And I was trying to tell him I wanted to take this theory of getting other writers to it. And he just gave me the biggest pep talk. Really? I don't even remember what he said, but I was literally in tears. It was like I was ready to go out and conquer the world. Cool. And, you know, I was just looking for drugs at that point. He was like, well, you could do that. <laughs> but, I mean, look, you're, you're in this weird situation. You might as well go enjoy it. And yeah. this man goes to South by Southwest, and he'll, like, tend bar at places. Or he'll come up to people and go, do you mind if I eat with you? Because I don't have anyone to eat with. Wow, that's incredible, man. And he just <laughs> soaks it up, and he hangs out with people. And it was this awesome thing. And I was with DJ Logic. You know, uh, DJ Yeah, Logic. of course. So he was in a cast at the time, and Bill gives us all a ride to the hotel, and he sits in the boot, you know, where the luggage goes. Yeah. This 60-year-old man is in the boot, and so I took a picture of it. I had to, and I tweeted to everyone that we kidnapped him. Yeah. Because he looked like he was under restraint. Like did. Yeah, and um, it was an amazing thing, because uh, you know, I told him, yeah, we were laughing, and McConaughey got sort of silly, and we handcuffed him just as a joke and threw him in the back of the van, and <laughs> then we all went skinny dipping, and... You know, Lake uh, LBJ, and then when we came back, there was just some broken glass. So I just went back to my hotel and got my luggage, got the fuck out of there. <laughs> yeah. I didn't want any part of that. But uh, so he left, but then we went, uh, McConaughey, we go to their place at the Four Seasons. Yeah. And we make way too much noise. And this is the night I have new managers who are trying to impress me. Great. And like, yeah, sure. Well, this is cool. This happens all the time. Yeah. And um, boom, 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 boom. Security. Now, as a musician, you know what you do. You do all the drugs that are on the table, and you leave. <laughs> so there's something on the table, and 
It wasn't what I thought it was. It was Molly. Oh, <laughs> that was my God, night. God, dude. But this is the difference between Hollywood and musicians. Oh, God. Musicians, when the, they go boom, 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 it's time to go. That yeah. means your number's up. We're giving you this chance to leave. Yeah. McConaughey goes, great. I want you guys standing post on the door. We'll be another two hours. They're like, oh, right away, Mr. McConaughey. Wow. And now they're working for you when your movie starts. So wow. We two more hours. And then we took the party back to my manager's place. So you had to probably Woody stay. Harrelson. You were probably pretty having, all right for a couple of days. <laughs> I, it, was, it was pretty fun. No, you know, it's, a, it's another day. And then at the very end of the night, uh, McConaughey, me and my, uh, you know, I'm just walking back over to the Radisson. And uh, he has to get a cab. He's going somewhere else because, you know, he lives in Austin. And uh, he realizes that I gave him the harmonica. You know, I'm Johnny Appleharp. I'm giving out harmonica. Yeah. And he goes, you're giving me this, aren't you? I said, yeah. And he goes, all right, all right. That's cool. And that was the end of the evening. <laughs> That's a good end. It was great. Bill Murray How long in the ago beginning. Was this? this was uh, 2009, I want to say. But uh, I'm not saying whose drugs were what or what actually occurred. But No, they were yours. I think a baby got impregnated. <laughs> Oh, man, God. By a small dachshund. <clears throat> That's terrible. But it yeah. sounds really fun. I want to go to that party. Yes. Um, C3 Presents. That's where you want to go, right? Yeah. It's okay to C3, yeah. Austin, Texas. Man, that sounds terrible. If you sign with them, they will guaranteed throw you a drug orgy <laughs> in their offices every time. Hey, speaking of drug orgy, yeah. would you mind uh, rolling the song with me? Yes, I'll roll the song. Let's I don't think I'd be nearly as good as you, but I'll, I'd love to like participate. Which, which song is this? Uh, it's called You Don't Have to Love Me. Ah, that you one. You cool with that? Uh, yes. Uh, how the hell I got it the go? words. You do? Oh, yeah, you're going to sing it? Well, I would like to sing it with you or after you or parts of it. Okay. So how about you? Do you do this one live a lot? All the t we did it just uh, yesterday. Because you probably make, I mean, you have this, a plethora of, uh, of music. You can a play. Pl a plethora. How many, uh, how many songs do we do? Yeah. Like, do you do two hours at this point or more? We got like three, four hundred tunes, something like that. So how many, how, how much time do you three, spend on stage for your fans? Um, well, it depends what they want us to do. I mean, we're capable of three hours. Yeah. But um, we don't like doing three hours. I would rather do 14 minutes. I mean, I'm a lazy <laughs> Me too, man. man. That's the thing. Like, Can music, we just play like that I, one song you dig and get that? Yeah. Like I said, music is uh, like water. So, you know, I mean, we go swimming if you want, but yeah. I'm already wet. What do you need? Yeah, let's go. But um, I love this tune. This is an Aaron Beaver song. <laughs> oh, cool. <clears throat> I just was, uh, if, if I could ask you. Uh huh. For you to get started, and, and then I'll like harmonize this chorus with you. Okay, and then you want and to then, try the uh, and then second verse? Can I take this part, you and then it. you sing the bridge? There is no bridge. <clears throat> well, th I consider this kind of a bridge. Oh, yeah, that is a bridge. You're right. You don't and then me. after the bridge, you can blow harp and do whatever you want. Okay. And then whenever you want me to come back in with you, On I'll, just, last uh, part. I gotcha. I'll just join you. Is that cool? What a nice little laying out. You, you've outlined that very quickly. Well, I, uh, I like to have whoever I, I, I interview or talk, uh -huh. a, you know, have a conversation with. I love to do music, like even Jim uh -huh. Brewer. Yeah. We did a little Metallica yesterday. Oh, there you go. He's an amazing I guy. I love Jim Brewer. He's, He's such an awesome one guy. One of the man. nicest guys. Totally. Oh, but uh, okay. do you need to read these words as well? I think I have them because we did it yesterday. But, you know, um, if you see me struggling, it's nice to have them. I'll go like this. I'm such or a I'll terrible sing, read I'll as I sing, sing guy. You. And, you know, now that I'm old, I have to do this sometimes. It's terrible. Eh, yeah, yeah, we're an A. Start with the dudes first. I'll do that with you too. Yep.
If they could be our last You don't have to love me You don't have to love me But tonight I'll be your man John Popper, you sing your my ass friend off. Jerry Becker, and uh, man, you're so great, dude. You're such a great singer. And oh, thanks. How, when, how did you get inspired by the harmonic of all things? I know that you've tried some. Well, well, you probably the, played many instruments, but the one that really we were drawn to was, I was that. A lot of instruments were forced on me because uh, when I was three, they found I had uh, perfect pitch or whatever. Yeah. And I'm related to David Popper, the cellist, so like right. runs in the family and all that. But I wanted to be a comedian, so it was really uh, hmm. the Blues Brothers got me into blowing the harp. Wow, crazy. And that led me to Paul Butterfield, led me to Muddy Waters because he did a lot of Muddy Waters tunes. Amazing. Led me to Elmore James. Right. But it was Hendrix. Right. When I heard Voodoo Child, that's when I knew I wanted to be a musician. And see, he does stuff on the guitar like... <laughs> You know, right. like a lot of Doppler effect things that really, really intrigued me, especially as I was discovering But to lead. turn a harmonica into current pop music is, it's a kind of well, see, the thing I- is about impossible it, almost. It so isn't, it. though. Like, that's the thing is everybody... Well, for you, you did It's an it, instrument like, of low expectations. And see, I think that's where I really identify with it. Is that, uh, but it, it also comes with so much of a history that there's a lot of negative uh, attached to it before you even say anything. Like, you go like, okay... I'm done with the harmonica because I said the last time I liked it was when Zeppelin did it, you know, like, and then, sure. and then you go like, well, that's what I play. You go like, all right, whatever. And then you play and you go like, holy shit. Like, that's a, that like, there's a great noise. People always made at the jam sessions. Um, when, you know, like when we, I went to New York, that was the first place I went. I told you I like Joan Osborne was the first, one of the first people I met at a jam session. Yeah. And we like formed a little band and she brought me over to the Nightingales where I met John O'Manson and. You know, he's been uh, integral in my music ever since. Hmm. You know, a real teacher to us. But the thing is, uh, there was always Dan Lynch, and they had a jam session. And, like, every time a harmonica player would show up, there was this palpable noise of, oh, no. Right. Because somebody would show up like... <laughs> and that's if they were good. But, you know, usually... Right. And I'm not I'm You just not that. buy one, you take it out of the box, and you just make all sorts of noise. And literally, if you go... <laughs> You're you're about as good as Alanis Morissette or a ton of I know people that. who play you know pretty badly. Terrible because it get, it's also an instrument of instant gratification. When you see Alanis Morissette play the harp, do you go like she's just giving the harp a bad name, or do you go like ah oh, that's cool? She's I'm amazed trying. she can fit the whole all ten holes in her mouth. She's a very wide mouth and can. <laughs> I can't do it. I'm like. She can fit, like I hear her on um, <laughs> one hand in my pocket, she's breaking the entire thing, like as a harmonica player, you're kind of amazed. Like you hear her like hurting. You're really her. amazed? Like, ow. Well, I that mean. That would be the right word for well, the Alanis Morissette solo. It's, it's a painful amaze. It's <laughs> yeah. like a, ow. How could you make such a beautiful bring, thing You do broke that. a harp that way. Like, <laughs> yeah. It, I have to do it, so I have to t- it takes me twice as long to break one of those. Right. But um, the, the thing is, um. A harmonica, what I don't like about harp players is uh, a lot of times they feel put upon. Like they're, they have clubs and they talk about harmonica rights. And 
I mean, come really? on. Yeah. And all you got to do is rip off sax players, rip off guitar players. And that's what they do. Guitar players get to rip off horn players. And right. horn players rip off guitar players all what's the time. A, what's the saying, though, is... is uh, Why borrow when you can steal? No, but there's, there's, a, there's another saying, too, which is amateurs borrow, professionals steal. Amen. Oh, Gandhi sorry. said that. Gandhi, yeah, well, that's right. That's exactly right. That was Gandhi. Uh-huh. Uh, so I'm going to let you go. Thanks so much for talking to me, oh, but I want to finish up with oh, sure. this last little bit. Uh, they're called My Wife's Questions. Oh, please. She like has that. a list of a uh, few things that she always asks I was me 21, to ask everyone. And yes, I did. No, she doesn't care anything uh, about the, the first time you drank. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh, of course. See, I took your sexual innuendo and like turned it into, you know, it's yeah. a gift. Um, <laughs> okay, so here are the questions, and they go like this. Uh, uh-huh. What are you afraid of? Um, wow, that is an awesome These question. These questions are so much more terrible and heart-wrenching than anything you just did for the last 45 minutes. You had um, fun, now it's work time. What I'm afraid of is the inevitable. Death. No, I just said the inevitable. See, I can get cryptic right back at you. Oh, I see what yeah, you did. Yeah, I'll bring it on. You son I'll of look a at, bitch. Look at me. Yeah. All right. So uh, I think that's, that's actually a really... I'm kind of that way, too. Yeah. The inevitable. Because that's what you're afraid of is whatever's coming for you. Yeah. And you know it's coming. Yeah. That's why you're afraid. Right. And truthfully, you got to just let it come and yeah. stop being afraid. But who does that? And nobody except for that just one guy. Just take your clothes off and guy. walk into traffic. It'll be okay. Yeah. It'll be all right. I've done that before. <laughs> yeah, me too. What are you best at? Um, being cryptic and avoiding questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably true. You want to know my system for um, not doing any? I decided when I was young not to do any homework and just see where that would take me. And it worked? Um, yes. Uh, you know what you do is... Uh, if my, you get my daughter's trying to figure that out right now. It's not working. Autumn, right. If you get a detention. No, no, no. My other daughter, oh, Amelia. Amelia, if you're home. out there, if you get a detention, skip the detention and they'll give you another detention. Right. Eventually, you get so many detentions, yeah. you can't possibly be there to do enough detentions. Okay. And you're free. They've lost the ability to punish you. And Don't then, get suspended. Don't get expelled, but just keep doing misdemeanors to the point where... But what happens when they go, if you don't show up at the next detention, you are no longer invited to the school? See, you have to play that dance where you go, no, I will be at that detention. And you say, (laughs) I'm going to be there. I want to be at this school. You make a case to be at this school. You You lobby to be at that school, and then you skip that detention. You are making me so happy to be the father of my children and not you right now. There was a point where there was all of my teachers and my guidance counselor and um, my mom in a room. Now, yeah. I can't lie to anyone, right? First thing you do, identify the factions. Half of the teachers thought the system Crazy. was to blame. The other right. thought that I was to blame. Now, what am I supposed to do as a young child when I'm getting these mixed messages here? I don't know whether I should be worried about myself or if it is the system that's to blame. And I get them arguing with each other. Are you serious? And they, you talk about this way to these people? Well, yeah, I was, I, this is, you're asking me what I'm best at. So um, I'm looking around. They're all arguing. I forgot what my the mom's got her was. head I'm in her so hands. Wrapped up in See, this. this is what you do. This is how <laughs> nobody learned anything in any of the classes. Yet we yeah. all had a good time. By the time you're done talking, well, we learned people, stuff. They probably are like, give that guy a hundred bucks and get him the this hell out of here. This is how I got here. through English class. And you know what? They I wrote a song about the space shuttle blowing up because I was a senior in '86. <laughs> and instead what? of doing any homework, I just did that. Yeah. And that worked. And see, in math, in math and science, it didn't work Teachers so good. Terrible. But like they had this rule that you had to graduate with 100 credits and my bass player Bobby he did it with 98 that's pretty good but I did it with 94 wow see that became a badge of honor like how little work you guys went can to you do high school together that's pretty cool man uh, the whole band we went to high school together that's cool um, you came up as friends uh, yes for the most part well you know sort of a weird you know uh, codependent friends sure. but of all families are codependent but that's what bands are they're codependent so what I'm best weirdos. at is avoiding work and I work very hard at it well, you're good as hell at it. Well, and thank you. I, I don't even want to ask you anything else. No, come on, come on. I, Hit me some more. I like these questions. Okay. Uh, they make me feel intelligent. W- what's left to do? Um, like, you know, it, whether it's your career or your, your uh, regular life, what is the thing that you're oddly, like, man, I got to make that? Oddly, so much more. I'm going to make an album with my keyboard player where there's no drums. Like, like the last song. You I'm hate Susie, your drummer. I knew it. As um, soon as I met you, I was like, I that love, guy hates his drummer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't hate him. I just hate what he stands for. Which is drums. Yeah, which is tempo. <laughs> which is keeping time. Tempo. <laughs> I want to, uh, I liked overpowering the piano on uh, Carol Let's the Moon, the last song on our album. Yeah. 
because I got to really bellow, and I don't have that powerful of a sure. voice. It's, Especially when no, my you, band has got this huge bass and drum throb. It's killing it's, me. It's incredible. I feel and very similar. I'm a similar. sucker for the ballads, and I never get to deliver them with this poignancy. And I just did a show in Rutland, Vermont, with my keyboard player. And we just did old Blues Traveler songs, but we're going to write for this. Great, man. And I got to deliver them. We were worried if we I'm had really 70 interested minutes. I'm in that record. That Two and a half hours later, great. everyone stuck it out. And I was delivering them. I didn't go Broadway. I went, that's what I was worried about. It's going to be too schmaltzy. Right. Like, am I going to be just hitting But the, you did wear spandex, though. None of that. I did not have to show my titties or anything. Wow. I did well. I'm actually interested in that record. See, to me, anything that you can do that's different than what you've different. done. That's, that's the cool. key. That's what's left to do is to be um, interested. Yeah, mix your, mix your stuff up. I love that. Um, cool. And, you, and the next question is, how will you do it? You just explained. Yeah. Your most memorable personal, personal moment that you can think of. It doesn't have to be in your life. It could be recently. Um. <laughs> because the next question is your professional moment. Okay, uh, personal moment. Um, well, it's got to be when that girl that you really didn't think liked you, that you really liked, turns yeah. out she likes you. I right. Mean, that's always good. When, that when was that? That happens periodically. You know? oh, okay. I yeah. mean, the first one's really good. Yeah. And uh, God, I was trying to kiss her, and it finally built up over like eight years. I've written all these songs about her, and right. you know, I actually loved her since high school. And we're sitting in a diner; she's back from Switzerland, and we're having the moment. And I swear to God, the waiter seemed to sense this and kept wanting to know if we wanted more ketchup. I swear to God, I don't know if he was putting me on. I would love to find that guy and beat the <laughs> shit out of him. You guys need more? No, we're good with ketchup. Look, mm. I just got a new ketchup. If you want one, huh? And like, we're about to move in. Like, you sure you don't want any ketchup? And he just kept trying to bring us a bottle of cat. I think maybe the guy had a thing for her. Huh. I don't know what it was. We should kill him. We really should. Someone should. You still should. have those guns. You holding right now? Yeah, um, no, I'm not. I, I, Man, and a gentleman get, never discusses those let's things. Let's go anyway. get one of those and find that ketchup bitch. The key to um, a gun play is know your liability and never threaten anyone on the air. <laughs> right. You just set it down, don't you? Isn't that the key? You just set it down and say... Again, a gentleman doesn't discuss these things in a recording environment. <laughs> All right. So your uh, most memorable <laughs> professional moment. Um, it could be uh, the Madison Square Garden. It could be yeah. uh, our gig in La Lachlan, Switzerland, where no one knew who we were. And um, so what we had to do... Uh, we, you know, we're, we just did the uh, festival, the Montrose Festival, yeah. and we were doing a little pickup gig in the hills of the Alps on sure. the border of Italy and uh, Swi in Switzerland, Italy and France, um, you know, Provence, wherever the hell that is. And that day, we'd happened to meet a bagpipe, fife, and drum corps from Brittany and told them... I was trying to tell one of them, I figured, oh, he You drums. know how weird you are, right? This isn't just like, I didn't just tell you for the first time, right? What? You 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 have some strange <laughs> stories. Like you meet yeah. <clears throat> you meet like bagpipers and stuff. You're attracting. You go on the, the world. You're going to accumulate life. some bagpipers. <laughs> it's real weird. And I had my harp, so I figured he drones and be flat. So we'll have him come sit in. With, oh, won't that be lovely? The band's like John. You figure it out. So that night, we fell asleep, and it turns out a torrential downpour has driven everyone back into their homes in this little village. Perfect. And the last band before us was a French cover rock yeah. song. Vol Giselle like, Heaven's Door. And so <laughs> everyone feels successfully rocked. The rain lets up and we're going on stage soon. And I realize there's like 15 bagpipe, fife, and drummers. And they thought I meant all of them. Oh, my God. And they're all nervous. And luckily, the sound guy, who I didn't talk to, seemed to know how to... You know, Micah, Fife and Drum Corps. <laughs> yeah. They were just there for their friend's wedding. They were in like the Gaelic Navy. You know, uh, Brittany is a weird <laughs> place where they don't even speak French. They speak a Gaelic variation. And so no one can communicate with them. And we're doing our stuff. And uh, back then, this was in the 80s, uh, they thought that Chuck Berry was rock and roll. They did not. They were listening to what we were doing like, oh, dear God, what are they doing? Like yeah. psychedelia had not made it over the pond yet. Right. You know, I don't know what happened to Europe in 72, but the Grateful Dead did not resonate. And we were being very psychedelic. So we say, hey, what the hell? Let's bring up the bagpipe from, from drum corps. And yeah. So I go, hit it. And they go, and I knew the band would know what to do. The drummer's like, boom. Bass player's like boom, back up, 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 boom, boom. Chance like, and I'm like, this huge sound. People start coming out of their houses because they had a contrast. They heard something they could identify, 
and then put us next to it. And, and then so they you got were it. pretty much. We needed words. You ended up. Playing. Guess what I sang? Just sit right back and you hear a tale, a tale of a fateful trip. That started from the, the whole place is we rocked the town because with Gilligan's Island. Because they didn't know what you're saying anyway. They didn't care at all. We used their soccer chant, though. Hey, 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 which led to a conga line around the square. Oh, my God, dude. It was absolute pandemonium. People came out of their houses. At, it looked like Hobbit Town, you know? Uh, and it what was like an a incredible talking, story. And I'm trying to go to sleep because we have to leave. And I hear drunken bagpipers, like, running up and down the <laughs> side. <laughs> And it was like somehow Man, it was liberation that's day. That's got to be yeah. No, not many people. A lot of people get to sell out Madison Square Garden, but not. I don't think anybody else has that story. That's that a was pretty, pretty good killer. Oh, and also, you know, playing for five hundred thousand people and meeting the president, stuff like that is fun. Clapton, BB King. I mean, I got so many great moments. Playing with the dead and not being selfish. Because so I, you played with the dead. Uh, we did Wang when, Dang Doodle when, when Jerry uh, was alive. Yeah, it was the last. Uh, it was when Bill Graham died. Uh, really? And last time I saw Bill Graham was at the same place on Golden Gate Park when so you, Miles you, Davis died. you've hung out with uh, Bill Graham, huh? Well, he was our manager. Wow, I didn't know that. He was the first guy to sign us because his huh. son David was graduating in Columbia. We were signed to Bill Graham first as well. No way. But we were signed after Bill died. Yeah, it's better when he's alive. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's... Well, they're Dead, paid. not so much. He, doesn't, he just sits there. there. He just sits there. He, well, yeah, he didn't, do, he didn't do much for us. Yeah, he, he's, he'd bump on a log. He was like, Bill's going to get you a deal, bro. It's going to be great. And you haven't lived till Bill Graham dude? has yelled at you. Yeah, I heard. Yeah. I heard he was like... A or when he looks at you and goes, wretched. power. No, he's a very sweet... You just got to understand he's teaching you things. Hmm. Like, he taught me a very important skill that I used until I just physically couldn't scream that loud anymore. If you have a very good argument and you yell it at the top of your lungs, you're double... You're overloading somebody because they're hearing your argument, but also they're being screamed at. So they don't know which to respond to first because they want to yell back at you, stop yelling like a lunatic, but you're not yelling like a lunatic. You're yelling sane, sentient things, and it's very effective, hmm. uh, especially when you're the boss guy. And I, it worked very well for years, but the problem is you have to keep throwing a bigger and bigger tantrum every time. Right. And after a while, I just, you know, I, I'm in a, I play music. I'm just not that angry. But he had the ability to, you know, like, promoters are kind of like mafia guys who aren't allowed to kill anyone. Right. So it's a very frustrating gig. Imagine if you're a mafia guy, but you don't get to slap anybody. That's going to be a terrible gig. The, the agita alone. Just think I of mean, the antacids I, I you need. Get to, I even get to hurt people. Yeah, you at least get to write a song about it or throw a tantrum or break about Like, if a, if a promoter does that, Bill Graham was the, the only guy who knew how to at least have an eloquent tantrum like he would do something eloquent or, i read his book and it was really really a great you know it was a it was brilliant. a great story about a guy who knew a whole lot about our business yeah and he everybody follows his lead but um uh, there's there's just no sack any nobody's got any balls anymore yeah but you know I they know, don't I need don't. them now now I, you need brains you need, i have the smallest i have the smallest package of uh the whole yeah but whole, i guarantee your balls are news. gargantuan compared to promoter balls because promoters have to worry about insurance and you just don't i have terrible balls they're, they're your not. liability is nowhere near what a promoter has to he has to worry about you See, yeah. all you got to worry about is you, and he has to worry about you, and then a hundred other guys like you. Yeah, right. And then all the people that are and then you know, try to, yeah, yeah, and then other people want his territory. So it's, 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 yeah, it's a creepy bummer of a business. Doing horde, I, I got a glimpse of it, and basically, I just went on site and hid. Right. Yeah, man. You didn't you, want people to see what you were being told, so you just did. You start were, horde yourself? Um, with, yeah, was it with, your idea. Well, it was a lot of people's idea, but I wound up. I found out day one that I was in charge. Hmm. <laughs> Like, John, what do we do? And it's like, that's cool. Oh, I better go in a room. Hold on. I just have to figure out who I'm going to yell at. I know exactly what to do and who to yell at. I'll be right back. <laughs> yeah. First, I'm going to the bathroom for a really long time. Yeah. I got some stuff to do. So I just want to finish up with these last couple. Oh, yeah. I, have, yeah. uh, uh, I have favorite holiday. Got one? Well, everyone loves Christmas. Not everyone. Um, that guy hates Christmas. Why do you hate Christmas so much? Christmas what did it ever babies. do to you? Worst. Were you raped on Christmas? Uh, 
<clears throat> he I wishes. Might have, I might have roofied but, myself. Oh, that was the day. That's what it was a Christmas party. It's notorious for roofies. So is that it? Christmas then? Um, well, uh, Christmas is good. Um, you know, Jerry's son, is a. Uh, he prefers Halloween by far over everything else. Halloween is good, but after you, there's only so much sugar you can ingest, it starts to lose its charm, unless you're really talking about the real Satan worship. Yeah. Well, no, he, yeah, he likes the, the, the sex and the orgies and the drugs. <laughs> well, I mean, that's not Halloween, dude. That's backstage. Well, see, that's a good holiday, too. Yeah, so backstage is your favorite holiday. Yeah, the okay. last, last gig of the tour is fun. Two, two more questions. Okay. Uh, a record or a song that you wish didn't exist could be yours, could be somebody else's. Something that you wish never happened. Ooh. Oh. See, this is a John Popper doozy right here. Yeah, I know, because you're saying my songs, that's, that's a chance to live life with a. I wish I'd done Most Precarious differently because they really wanted us to do it like Runaround, and I would have done that. You would have? Done that differently. Like mm. I, w- I would have had more of a cut time thing or, or, or half time. But um, songs that I wish didn't exist... Um, or just one. One song. One, one album, one song, one... Rock Me Amadeus. That one. Definitely not a bad choice. Yep. and yeah, Actually, um, great choice. Pretty much the entire collected works of Duran Duran. Really? Duran Duran, not on your not on your love list. The only thing I found useful was there is a faint sound of porn at the end of Hungry Like a Wolf. Hungry like that. that. No, you got, and, oh yeah, yeah, right. There's a girl making that noise. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with that. And that was before a young boy could find porn easily, so I of had to course. really use my imagination and drown out Simon Le Bon. Man. I know a girl who lost her virginity to Simon Le Bon when she was 15 and wow. ran to tell her best friend who was also 15. And before she could, her friend said, I just lost my virginity to Simon Le Bon. Oh, my God. He tagged two 15-year-old girls in the same night who were best friends. I oh, mean, that's terrible. And yet we admire him, strangely. I'm getting some clapping over there, but I don't want to say who it's... Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I have one last question. <laughs> or here's the last one. I, okay. I really find it that a lot of people resonate with this, and this is like the defining moment that they have. But maybe for you, nothing. But All right, wait, hang on. Is there right, something is up. that Hold someone up. said to you that changed the course of your life? Many times. What is the thing that you that sticks out as being? If that guy wouldn't have said that I was a uh, this, or if he didn't say <laughs> that I could or I couldn't, or whatever. Those are the big moments that I feel like musicians have. There's a few. I'm going to say a couple things to you after this interview that I think might change the course of your life. This is where I have to now buy like uh, <laughs> one of those timeshares, right? This is one of those timeshare things. I'm trying to sell some. I'm not going to get to leave unless I buy to, a condominium. You don't have to buy it, but I would like to buy you some spaghetti and take you to this place. Oh, I <laughs> The blues is a sound a baby makes when it cries for the first time, because after that he knows he'll be picked up and it's all show business. That's wow. A, that's a good one. Who wrote that? Well, Arnie Lawrence told me, and that was at the New School. And um, then another thing Chico Hamilton told me at the New School, where I showed up late again for class, because I'm always late. And he said, this cat, the groove always winds up landing in his pocket. Hmm. And... I was like, yeah, but he said, but you are always late, and once you are late, you will always be late. Hmm. And I've been late ever since. It's been the damnation of me. I so, love that guy. Yeah, you he met really the coolest guy. Here, here. Well, Chico Hamilton is one of the coolest. You know, I'll so tell you. Those were like, uh, th- those weren't like on my. Hey, high, you're never gonna make it, kind of stories. I did have one of those. Uh, like, I mean, there's always those. But they took my evaluation when um, I started in high school. You know, my not doing homework plan. Sure. And they said, where do you see yourself in 10 years? And I yeah. said, in 10 years, I, I will be a famous musician, won't have to worry about money. And they said, John has problems with reality. That wow. Was, I love that. And that lady's dead now. Is she? Well, yeah, she was probably in her 60s. See, I'm going to live forever, so no one was ever going to be able to say <laughs> that about me. And that prick's dead. It'd be like, no, I'm not. You won't grow old and you won't ever die. <laughs> yeah. How, how old are you? How old are you? I'm 44. Yes. How old are you? I'm 46, and you should know by now that you are going to die. Yeah. Oh, wait. Anyway, that was a great yeah. interview. Uh, <laughs> so you know what great it is? ending. You're a lot healthier than me, so you still feel like you're going to live forever. No, I, uh, I actually... Have you lost your gallbladder yet? You know, I just... <laughs> <laughs> they just took mine a couple of weeks ago, and I got to tell you, 
the drugs are fun, but you're like, oh, you know. You and there's a lot you can't eat, right? My, uh, my. I haven't learned a thing. I just went back to eating it, and now I just take, I just shit a lot more frequently. Oh, that's great. We should talk about that. I hope to see you this summer on tour. You're on tour this summer oh, with, yeah. uh, <clears throat> just kind of. Uh, are you doing festivals and everything like that? You're not doing a I package think, like la last year. You um, were... I don't think this year, but uh, there's talk about doing Horde next year, and oh, I think we're going to cool, make a real man. good run for it. And uh, yeah, I love that idea. We want to do it this year because last year was the 20th anniversary. Ah. Then this year was going to be the 15th anniversary of the last time we did it. Like oh, cool. desperately clinging to some numerical, you know, symmetry. Right. But next year, I don't know. The 22nd anniversary of the first time or the 16th anniversary of the second time. They both sound terrible. I know. Add them together. Call and it something else. Mix it up and call Horde, it the 50th yeah. year anniversary. Horde Y2K. Yeah, we'll just count wrong. Y2K. Yeah, and incidentally, it's always our 40th time at Red Rocks this year, so... It's Man, you guys symmetry. have been selling Red Rocks out forever, huh? It's just endless. That's and awesome. you know what? That feeling of, I can't believe we sold it, like... It, do that the 20th time and you feel just so blown away. Yeah. We we just started doing it uh, the last couple summers and, you know, uh, Chuck Morris has become a great friend. I love him and he's, he's great at Kung Fu, too. Are you kidding me? Just, yeah, Chuck Morris, man. He did all those movies. Oh, Lost Chuck, in Vietnam. That's Chuck Norris. Oh, no. <laughs> You've been talking to the I've promoter. I've been sending the wrong dude a whole him, bunch of tapas. Dude. Show um, me some moves. I keep punching him, and he doesn't do anything. I thought he could just take it. Nope. He's, you, you've been punching I've the been wrong guy. I've been kicking the shit out of... No, I think I, I've been sending stuff to Chuck Norris. <laughs> He's like, well, who the hell is this guy? Uh, man, thank no, you so much for, uh, for talking with me today. Um, uh, you rock. Congratulations. You're congratulations. See, I think I'm going to do this for a living. This isn't a living. This is just one, my way of being able to meet people. See, I think like if 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 I have to rely on well, being it's a good backstage, thing, it's a good thing you're no married then because ever you're never going to get laid with all of this crap. No, 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 no. This is not about getting laid. Yeah. Uh, this is about like well, being then why able do you to meet, be in a room. Then why with, do you meet people? Because I I think like this is interesting. Like t to me, life is like you get to the point where you're of an age where you go like, man. Why am I going to keep doing that? Why do I want to write a song for the radio? Why do I want to try to make another video or be in that movie? To get or, laid. And then you go like... Uh, Isn't that the reason? I just want to meet interesting people. I have like the greatest wife and like... Yeah, if, I know. See, I so then no, there's no reason to do anything. I, I say, should just stay home. Put on the sweatpants and start painting that walls and watch TV. <laughs> Isn't that the reason? I hey, mean, hey, you know, uh, my friend Pergo here, he la just recently went to a, uh, uh -huh. you could do this with your buddies if you ever have a, uh, a uh, bachelor party. They all went to a strip club with uh, basketball shorts and no underwear on. <laughs> Just to see, it was like it was like Wiener Roulette. So you could try that, and uh, that's cool. Well, so yeah, we just took ecstasy and ate stuff out of a yeah. That's not even butt. nearly as cool as as out of what a uh, hooker's butt. Oh. Okay, well, there's no better ending than that. Thanks so much, man, for uh, for talking to me today. And uh, I love I love your music, and I think you're I love a yours super right gifted back. guy. And you're a super Thanks gifted a guy. I like you're you're a smart motherfucker. Well, I, uh, you got the second part right. Uh, ah. But uh, thank you so much. I so really you married your, it. So you're saying you married your mom? I did. I married my mom. and Well, actually, then she's a goodly, comely woman. And tell her I said hello. I shall. I don't know what accent that was. No, comely just means handsome in the old, old timey talk. I didn't ask about the word. I just meant your accent's terrible. That was my accent. She's a goodly, comely woman. Oh, that was just you and your regular voice. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, man. <laughs> I was talking like a... Maybe I was talking like Mrs. Garrett from Facts of Life a little bit, but... <laughs> girls! Girls! <laughs> Thanks, man. Sure. For the record, Perga would like you all to know that he did not actually go to the strip club with basketball shorts on and no underwear. He did wear underwear uh, under the basketball shorts. Um... It wouldn't have made a difference. I'm not sure anybody would have noticed. There you go, folks. John Popper of Blues Traveler on the podcast. Susie Cracks the Whip is their latest record. That's a, what, a great, what a great title. Some bands just know how to name records. Uh, if you want to visit them, you can at bluestraveler.com or at blues underscore traveler on Twitter. And we're on Twitter as well and Instagram at... Podcast, 
And you can visit us anytime and all the time at patcast.com. Love you. I'll see you on the boat soon. I need a tan real bad. See you later.